Hi, my name is Adam Marcus, and I'd like to welcome you to Vince Ritchie's How to Secure a Fulbright Fellowship. Um, Vince, why don't you begin? Thanks a lot. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the uh, Fulbright uh, aspect of today's AGOC online, uh, online sem seminar and summit. I want to welcome you. Uh, we had quite a few sign-ups for this event, and I was really honored to see uh, the level of interest. We had more than 60 people sign up. We've got 10 people now in the room. Uh, so if you would sign up for this event, uh, or if you know a friend who's interested in a Fulbright, uh, tell him to get online. We're going to be here for 50 minutes uh, tonight, uh, just under an hour, and then this event will also be rebroadcast on my website and also the AGAP website. Um, let's get started. I want to tell you a little bit about myself and my background. Um, that's my name and my picture in the top right corner, which is hard to see. Um, I am a graduate of Stanford University. I am an educator and entrepreneur. I run a small business. Uh, which is, can be found online at vinceprep.com. Like the other presenters today, I am a, a graduate admissions counselor. Um, I got my start um, after Stanford. I went to NYU and got my master's degree in educational technology, uh, things like webinars and other things, using technology to teach. Um, and I've been a writing teacher since 1990. For 20 years, I, pretty much everything I've ever done has involved teaching writing. My early days teaching was at a program called Summerbridge. Um, while I was still in college, I taught in San Francisco. And my own, uh, the writing department was headed up by a wacky, fun guy named Dan Handler. That's a picture of Dan. Dan's an author now, um, a best-selling author. He's also known as Lemony Snicket, uh, which was a movie uh, as well um, with Jim Carrey in it. Anyway, that's, I've had some great teachers. That's why I put a picture of Dan in here. Dan taught me how to teach writing. Um, and then I, I went to Summerbridge program, which started in San Francisco. I went down to New Orleans, and I taught there at the school that was attended by this fellow. Uh, that's Peyton Manning, uh, and we all know uh, how that story turned out. Uh, go Saints. <laughs> I lived down in New Orleans for five years. I'm going to do some polling later on. I want to find out where you guys are. If there's anyone uh, who's in New Orleans at the moment or been in New Orleans, I'm not from there, but it, it, I consider it my second home, and I have a real soft spot for that city, and I'm just happy to see them on the rebound. Um, what I do now, as I said, is I'm an admissions counselor. I've been doing that uh, work since 2002. Um, I do that work based most of the year, 10 months out of the year. I'm based in Tokyo. At the moment, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, and it's beautiful here. Um, nice to be back home. This is where I grew up. But I'm based in Tokyo 10 months out of the year. Um, I've helped 10 Fulbrighters. And a quick disclaimer, I have no affiliation at all with the Fulbright organization. I'm simply doing this uh, wearing my, my hat as an admissions coach, and business counselor. This is Senator Fulbright um, in, uh, around the time that he set up the program, right after World War II. Um, the Fulbright organization uh, wants a lot of things, quite honestly. And it's, it's tricky because there's over 7,000 Fulbright grants awarded in any given year from more than 150 countries. Um, the good thing about all that is that the Fulbright organization is incredibly easy to access and very transparent. Um, uh, all of the information from this, for this presentation was compiled from online sources. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think that there's incredible information out there for anyone who has a computer and an internet connection. Um, contact them directly. There are all kinds of when I was getting this together, I was sending the word out to friends of mine who've received Fulbrights, and they were saying, oh, yeah, go check this out. In this city right now, there's a, a panel that you can go speak directly with Fulbright officers and get your questions answered. They make themselves incredibly uh, easy to find. Um, our focus for today, we can't cover everything. The Fulbright process is, is, in, involves many, many, many steps. For today, um, I'm going to fo focus on what I do best. Again, I've taught writing for 20 years, and I'm going to focus on the essays. The first essay that's important, um, probably the most important, and I'm going to spend the most time talking about it, is the statement of grant purpose. That's the future project that you're proposing to write. Um, the next uh, important uh, thing that you need to write is the personal statement, which is mostly about the past. It's also a statement about the present. Um, so the personal statement is about the past and the present, and the um, what's left, obviously, the future. So um, the statement of grant purpose, which is what you want to do in the future. And that's, I think, where I can add the most value, and that's where I'm going to spend most of my time today, putting it together into a complete picture of past, present, and future. Um, 
again, I'm going to focus mostly on the essays because, again, it's what I've been doing the longest, teaching, writing, and as an essay counselor, it's the first big step. Hopefully you get the interview, and that's a whole separate conversation, but um, you will never get the interview if your essays don't make sense. That's my opinion, and I think Fulbright Commission would agree. Um, the statement of grant purpose is a research proposal. It's also a study plan. Um, it's a statement of your goals, and ultimately, as I mentioned before, it's a statement really focusing on the future. Um, it's future focused. Now, developing a strong, feasible, and compelling project is the most important aspect of a Fulbright, of a successful Fulbright application. Those are not my words. Those come directly from the Fulbright website. So this is where my I'm taking this from them, folks. This is what they say. It's the most important thing. Um, your first tip should be to familiarize yourself with the program summary for the country to which you're applying. Now, what I've just said can end up looking like this. That's the Tokyo subway. What I mean is, um, good luck, right? The program summary for the country to which you apply. Now, where are you going to find that? It may sound like I'm speaking a foreign language, but remember, um, Fulbright's easy to access. Um, the Internet is your friend. Um, the organization is incredibly transparent. Everything is written down um, in multiple language in many languages in many cases. Um, and hopefully then th that crazy subway map can end up looking as clean and clear as this, which is a subway station. Um, not Tokyo, by the way. Uh, please ensure that your project design fits the program guidelines for your host country. That's, again, the Fulbright. Uh, th those words are coming directly from the Fulbright organization. Um, this is a sample I downloaded from their website. Again, everything is online. You can see samples. Um, you, can, you can read the testimony of current and former Fulbrighters um, and contact them again directly. They, they make themselves easy to find. Um, you want to demonstrate in detail what and how your research will contribute to your discipline. I'm going to underline that word. It's the, it's the most important word, I think, in this entire process. Um, you want to make sure your proposed tribute to one of the designated project areas identified by the Fulbright Commission of your country. Um, I sent these slides uh, to one of my former clients who was a Fulbright recipient herself. I helped her with that process, and then she, get on, she got into the Harvard Kennedy School. She received a bunch of other, other funding from other sources as well. And she told me that um, the way to add value for me as a counselor when giving this presentation is to help you guys understand that essentially, in her words, it's all about contribution. Now, what do we mean by contribution? We're not talking about financial contribution. This is what you give to Fulbright. Um, it includes an addition to your field's overall knowledge that also enhances the understanding between the U.S. and any other nation. The Fulbright is, um, is, was initiated by the U.S. government, and the purpose of it is to increase communication and global understanding. Those are wise words. Um, you want to ask yourself six questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and yes, you guessed it, how. Now, those questions are not particularly unique. There's nothing inherently Fulbrighty about them. You could ask yourself those six questions if you're a journalist um, or a scientist or an engineer or a business person. Um, so what I want to do as a counselor is to customize them for the Fulbright process. And again, a lot of this is coming from the Fulbright uh, website itself. So first of all, with whom do you propose to work? That's a good first question. And then next, what do you propose to do? Um, what is exciting, new, or unique about your project? What contribution, again, our, front, our favorite word, will the project make to the Fulbright objective of promoting cross-cultural interaction and mutual understanding? This is, a, this is a grant. This is a scholarship. This is an award with a mission. This isn't just... They're not just throwing money at you. They have a mission, and they want you to help them fulfill that mission. That's the contribution that they want you to make. Um, when? When are you going to carry out your study or research? They want to see a timeline. Um, why? Why do you want to do it? My favorite question, why, why, why? Um, why is your project important or significant? And this is the killer question. I, I think this question is absolutely the one that often, when I'm speaking to someone, um, kind of floors them and, and makes them step back and think. Again, to use the example of, of my former client, um, I asked her this question when she was starting the process, and she just she really didn't know what to say. She had to really go think about it. Um, she was doing. She was helping. She works for the um, International Organization for Migration, 
Um, and she wanted to go and, and get a Fulbright and, and go and study policy to help alleviate, uh, in her case, human trafficking is the issue. And she's given, by the way, she's given me permission to mention her example. Um, so when I asked her that question, um, she really had to go back and think about it. But what she came back really amazed me and obviously not only impressed me, it impressed Fulbright, it impressed Harvard, it impressed all the scholarships that she received and all the schools to which she was admitted. She could identify the resources that were available in the U.S. that were simply not available in her home country and in this case, given that I was in Japan at the time, um, she was applying from Japan. So there were things that she could study and do that simply um, would better understand, help her better understand her subject matter. And then I really asked her how. How will you carry out your work? Um, what methodologies will you use? Um, in her case, she talked about having access to archives um, and specialists in her field. Um, she wrote about making site visits and conducting interviews. Those are things you're not going to be able to do where you are now. You're going to have to go somewhere and find those people and access them. Um, and that's, that's an inherently, that's a wonderful use of, of a grant, of a Fulbright Award. Uh, um, in terms of how, how will your Fulbright project help you further, help further your academic or professional development? They really want to know again about the future. This is someone, the client that I'm mentioning, um, and all the people I've ever helped get a Fulbright, and anyone I've ever helped really get in anywhere, is someone who can connect A, B, and C, who can connect the dots. The other piece of advice I got from my former clients who received Fulbrights was to link your proposal to current issues in your field. Now, um, in your home country and or host country, how can you contribute, again, our favorite word, how can you contribute to issues such as, and these are just examples, but um, uh, good governance, uh, poverty alleviation, uh, rule of law. Again, these are just examples from social or political science. I, I want to hear from you guys really soon and, and see where you're coming from, what your backgrounds are. Those are uh, just a few examples. Um, what you want to avoid is, as our friend Senator Fulbright or anyone on the Fulbright Commission who's reading your application to say this, um, this sounds important, but I'm not sure why. That's a red flag. Um, you're saying a bunch of buzzwords, you're mentioning a bunch of lingo, but you're not explaining it in really simple terms. Because remember, most of your interviewers, you, you, you can't pass the Fulbright, you can't get a Fulbright without going through the interview process, and most of your interviewers are not from your field. Whatever your field is, um, they're not from there. Only one, usually, is from your actual field. And so, again, in the, using a bit of wisdom, um, you want to remember your audience. Um, also, whenever possible, try to avoid academic or professional jargon. It doesn't impress them, it just confuses them. Just express yourself in, in simple words. And most importantly, use examples. This is, these are the words, again, I, I like quoting or I like mentioning uh, stuff that I'm finding directly from Fulbright, so this way you know that, that the stuff's coming directly from the source. This is something that was written, I found, in one of the newsletters. Um, written by a, a Fulbrighter, and this is what she said about this idea of getting feedback. She says, although intelligent people will be reading your proposed plan of study, few, if any, will be specialists in your field. The longer you spend in a field, the less you realize when you are using technical terms. She says, my assigned mentor took my proposal, underlined everything she didn't understand, and made me do it again and again. Then I sent my proposal to my parents, who were also not linguists, and I wrote it again, and yes, again. You can see this is a very time-consuming process. Um, each time I clarify the ideas while reducing the terminology. She's cutting out those rare words that seem impressive and special, but really all they really serve to do is confuse someone that isn't in your exact field. Thanks to my simple example, one read my application was able to intelligently explain my proposal to her boss based solely upon what I had written. That is the goal. And then she says, I will never again write a grant application without passing it in front of as many non-specialist eyes as are willing to read it. This advice also applies to most graduate school and other scholarship essays. That's, those are, that's my advice. We're, we've moved on from Andrea's advice. Um, you know, even if, and, and here I want to give, I want to give you guys a quick pep talk. Um, if you're even thinking about uh, doing a Fulbright, um, the process itself, even if you're not, look, you know it's competitive. I think that's why you're here today listening to this. 
right? Um, but even if you're not picked, the process of writing a Fulbright grant will absolutely help you um, with any other scholarship you apply to or any other graduate school to which you apply. And a word on that in terms of other scholarships. In the Fulbright application, you're asked, are you applying for other scholarships? The answer should be yes. Um, and be honest about it. Um, they, want, they know that a Fulbright award, someone asked me the other day, what's the typical size of the award? It really varies. It can be everything from just a, a plane ticket and, no, and nothing else to you know, tens of thousands of dollars. It really, really depends. And again, 7,000 different grants given and lots of variation in there. But it's never enough to cover all of your expenses, right? Graduate school is expensive. Any country you go to or living expenses are always high, um, really anywhere these days. And so um, you, need, you need other support. Um, the other thing to, that some of my former clients said I should mention is passion. Um, how will your studies impact your field? What do you want to change? I think that's a great question. Um, how will your studies and their impact change society? And a lot of the Fulbright recipients are teachers. If you're teaching, what new perspectives will you use from your research, from your project, from your proposal, and how will they enter your curriculum? The other question to ask yourself and have your mentors ask you and ask of your essays is, is it worthy? Again, we're, we're talking about funding here, and um, it's competitive. You've, is it feasible? Can you account for the resources relevant to your project of your host nation and host institution, as well as, again, a time frame and, uh, and funding of the grant? Can you demonstrate that you have already taken enough steps to set up parts of your research? Any factor that could raise doubts about the likelihood of completing your project should be accounted for in your proposal. And look, I'm spending a lot of time on this uh, aspect again. This is the future essay, the statement of grant purpose. It's only two pages, but it takes the project, of, the, the process of researching can take months. It should take months. Um, all right, now, now Mr. Fulbright is, is Senator Fulbright is, is, is happy. He understands. Um, I, I was going to pause here for questions, and I apologize now that I'm not going to because, um, again, because we, we had that, that glitch. I'm just going to power through. We still have over 20 minutes, and I, I, the, the, the second part of my uh, um, proposal here, the uh, second part of my presentation is a lot shorter. Part two deals with the personal statement. Um, the personal statement, again, is about the past, and it's about the present. Um, it allows you to highlight the person behind the project in – and here's the key, folks, no more than a single page. So the you're going to write about the future in two pages. You're going to write about the past and the present in only a page. And if you think it's easy to write a great one-page essay, uh, guess again. It's, it's hard. As Mark Twain said, you know, it, um, I would have written something shorter if I had more time. That's a bad paraphrasing of Mark Twain. Um, it takes more time to write a great one-page essay than it does to write um, a ten-page essay. Take it yeah, and... and, and uh, and anyway, that's my personal pers and professional perspective. Um, you want to write a narrative that gives, you, uh, gives a picture of you as an individual. It's your opportunity to tell the committee more about how you came to this point in your life and where you see yourself in the future. Again, these are Fulbright's words. And a quick word about how I see my role as an admissions counselor, admissions coach. Um, I, I assume I'm speaking for some of my fellow AGAC members in this, but it, I'm certainly speaking for myself. I am not the boss. The question is the boss, okay? In this whole process, I always defer to, well, first of all, the client is the boss, and also the other boss is the question itself. And this is the question from Fulbright, and so that's why I'm, I'm giving you the question. And I, I, I give a, a huge amount of respect to these questions because you've got to really think about them. Um, they are always in charge. Your personal statement can deal with your personal history, family background, their influences on your intellectual development, the educational and cultural opportunities or lack of them to which you have been exposed. I'm reading very fast, by the way. This is all online. Um, and the ways in which these experiences have affected you. Um, and, and let me begin here. Um, the educational and cultural opportunities or lack of them. Now, that's an interesting phrase. And this is nothing is accidental. These are the Fulbright Commission's words. Uh, why are they adding that lack of them? I get this question. Um, I've gotten this question before, and I want to directly address it. Some, someone has asked me in the past, what if I have no prior international experience? Can I still get a Fulbright award? Again, I'm, I'm directly quoting the Fulbright website. Um, this is an issue of the chicken and the egg, the, 
these aren't from Fulbright. These are from me. Uh, chicken and egg. What comes first? You don't, you don't need prior experience abroad to be a strong candidate. On the contrary, the purpose of Fulbright is to expose Americans to the world and vice versa. So this is directly from Fulbright, folks. If, if you've always been in your home country, um, apply, please. They want you to apply. That's the point. Um, the personal statement should not be a recording of facts already listed on the application or an elaboration of your statement of grant purpose, which we talked about in the first 20 minutes of this presentation today. In other words, they don't want it to be boring, okay? They don't want you to simply repeat yourself over and over again. Um, it's really a biography, but specifically related to you and your aspirations relative to the Fulbright program. You want to show in detail what has made you successful in the past and will facilitate the success of your proposed project. Again, folks, this is our um, magic triangle here, a uh, future past and present. You want to show that who you are and what you can do is, in the words of our friend Steve Jobs, insanely great, um, not looking like this. A lot of us feel like this. I, I felt like this a few days ago. <laughs> um, but can you actually put together a uh, an arc, a, a story, a curve that shows what you did in the past, in the beginning, whatever it was, college or graduate, you know, and then going on to graduate school, or if you're already out of school and you're working, your first job and maybe now your second job and whatever you're doing now, can you put it all together? Can you connect the dots? Um, you want to demonstrate that you can achieve goals. You want to demonstrate that you can prioritize and follow through on your objectives. You want to demonstrate that you learn from your mistakes. That's, that's a critical factor of maturity, I find. And you want to show that you have leadership and communication skills. Um, a, way to, a way to do this, this is something I do with my clients all the time, is try to help them think about what, what they chose, why you went to X college, why you studied Y subject, why you entered Z profession. Um, and then what you learn from it. Um, cause and effect for it, folks. What you chose and what you learn. There should be a link. And again, you want to show that great arc, not the, uh, <laughs> the sad elephant. Um, next question is, do I believe you? I, I ask myself this question all the time when I'm working with a client. Um, and the Fulbright, um, can you help the Fulbright Committee understand how your background best prepares you to execute your plans? I'm, I'm, I'm underlining that phrase here, best prepares you. I love that phrase. Um, cause and effect, causal relationships are, are critical. It's critical that your personal statement fully support your project proposal. Why are you uniquely qualified to realize your ideas? Can you bring the future into clear focus? The next question I always ask myself as a counselor when I'm, when I'm listening to anyone, um, or even when I'm, heck, when I'm re reading a novel or, or seeing a movie is, do I care? Um, and this is where my background uh, as a storyteller comes into play, and I'm going to emphasize this a little bit because I think it's a bit unique. Um, I've done professional Shakespearean acting. I did that um, after I was done. I went to graduate school. I was also a founding member of an improv troupe at Stanford. This is a book that was recently written by my professor and teacher and mentor, um, Patricia Ryan Madsen. A uh, great book, by the way. Um, not about Fulbright, about life and improv theater, and worth reading even if you are not interested even in doing any improv. Um, anyway, my point is all that background helps me uh, help you tell great stories. One thing I love, probably what I love the most about what I do for a living as a counselor is I love, absolutely love, helping people tell great stories. Great writing is, is great storytelling. I've always been a writing teacher and I'm a sucker for a great story and I'm always trying to get my clients to tell me a story that I believe and I care about because if I believe it and I care about it as a total outsider, um, it's much more likely that whoever's reading it on the other side, in this case the Fulbright Commission, um, is going to believe it and care about it as well. In terms of admissions counseling and the Fulbright, the things that that um, that, that we counselors have helped people with before is the CV, uh, clarifying goals. Um, and you know future projects, helping someone structure their personal statement again just by a Socratic method of asking a lot of questions. Um, we help with interview training, 
and we give second opinions. You've shown this thing to 15 people in your network, or two at least. Um, again, and you've you've clarified things that are um, spe too specific, and you 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 think it's as good as it can be. Show it to a counselor or a mentor and get a second opinion. Um, a few quick tips. We're almost done, and I want to take your questions. A few quick tips. Um, uh, when you do your CV, your, which is, uh, I think you know, a CV, curriculum vitae, which is just a fancy way to say resume, but it's slightly different. That's a different subject, by the way. Not going to get into that today. Um, but you want to do the CV and the personal statement together. Why? Because of this. The CV, the resume, is what you did. And, and the personal statement is how you did it. And if you can put the what and the how together, um, this is my cute little phrase, what plus how equals wow. If, 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 if what you do and how you do it are clear, um, you're much more likely to impress your reader. And that, folks, is the goal. Clear, compelling, competitive. That's what you want. Um, so, again, next steps, Vince's advice. Do CV and personal statement together next. When you're doing the research and writing of your project proposal or statement of grant purpose, which I think should is probably likely going to take you months of work if if it's good. Uh, I'm not kidding. Don't kid yourself. This is a this is a noble effort and this is a serious effort. This is not something to play around with. But the rewards, as you know, it's why you're giving up your time to follow along here today. The rewards are fantastic. Um, um, the Fulbright network, the Fulbright name, most importantly. Um, the Fulbright experience of going outside your comfort zone, going to another country, researching what you love, and finding a way to improve the world. Heck, that's, can you think of a better way to spend a year? I sure can't. Um, anyway, do the research and writing with an eye towards interview preparation. Again, your interviewers, and again, you cannot get funding without passing the interview. Most of those interviewers hail from other disciplines. They are not specialists in your field. So again, to, to, sum up the, to sum up my advice here for today, you want to do the CV and personal statement together. You want to research and write your project proposal, a.k.a. statement of grant purpose, at the same time thinking about interview prep. In other words, um, take out lingo, keep it simple, get feedback. And finally, this sounds silly, but it's true, enjoy the process. If you enjoy writing, um, any reader will enjoy reading something that you enjoyed writing. And the conversations that you can have with friends and mentors, and academic advisors, professional mentors, anyone, even a counselor, the conversations can be stimulating and fun. Um, and again, the, the rewards speak for themselves. Um, last few tips here. Start early, get help, contact Fulbrighters. As I've said, and don't, don't take my word for it, go online, read the newsletters, read the statements by current and former Fulbrighters, Contact the staff. They put their phone numbers and names right in there. Um, they host all kinds of free events. They want to talk to you. Um, you know, they, they want to help you. I believe that. It's competitive, but it's not cruel. They want you to do a good job. They want you to succeed. As far as me, um, check my, my website and blog as you like. This presentation will be up there. Um, I do enjoy sharing information. I do enjoy sharing information for free um, because I'm at heart a teacher. I've always been some kind of teacher and it really does give me great joy to share information with people. Um, so check my website as you like. Um, also check AGAC, the, the sponsors of today's organization. AGAC.org, um, we are a group of experienced and ethical counselors and, and that's where you can find the list of members. Um, Adam, who's, who's gonna, I'm going to turn this over to Adam in a few minutes to pass along some of your questions. Are, are we getting some questions, Adam? Uh, not at the moment yet, but uh, hopefully we'll we'll get some. All right, so let me just plant that seed. Um, in the next minute or two, I hope uh, you have questions. There's there's actually more than 15 people online at the moment. Um, again, far more than we expected for this first try. And um, please ask questions. If not, Adam and I uh, can can chat about this because Adam's also a, quite an experienced counselor who's helped a lot of Fulbright uh, applicants over the years. Um, and and again to to embarrass Adam slightly, or not embarrass him, but uh, Adam and Steve both were great, a great help in putting this together. Most of the content, much of the content from today's uh, presentation, these slides came originally from Adam's blog. Um, another fellow counselor, a fellow AGAC member, Steve Green, wrote a post on Adam's website, and that um, link is right there in front of you. And all these slides are going to be online. If you're not 
jotting, scribbling down these links, which I suspect are not, um, this will all be on. Uh, online quite soon, uh, within the next few weeks, on my website as well as agac.org. Um, a few more resources and links here, giving credit where credit is due. Uh, again, the Fulbright site. Um, there are various organizations with various names that fall under the Fulbright um, group. Uh, one of them, one of those links is here. There's a, a lot more, more of them. Um, one of them is iie.org. The other is fulbrightonline.org. Um, that second link that's on your screen right now is where I found those instructions for the personal statement. Um, I compiled a bunch of links, which is this third link is a link of links. It's um, a social bookmarking site that I use. That little tiny link, bit.ly uh, slash full, full tips, full bright tips, full tips. And the next one, full tip vids, those are videos I found on YouTube with um, interviews with Fulbright staff, uh, statements and profiles of Fulbright recipients, um, a lot of fun videos to watch, a lot of great links in, in uh, number three and number four here. And finally, um, fun sites, social networking sites like Twitter, um, I'm Tokyo Events, and the Fulbright, Fulbrighters, Fulbright organization is using Twitter, and I'm following them. So one way to find them is to find me and then find them through that. Another way is to just go to Twitter itself and look, look up Fulbright um, if you're into that kind of thing. Most of all, good luck um, signing off here and turning this over to questions um, and or just a kind of a general chat with Adam. Um, I'm Vince Ritchie. Thank you very much. Um, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I'm based in Tokyo. At the moment, I'm near San Francisco, and I'm online at VincePrep.com. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, Vince. So the uh, first couple of questions, um, well, one which is actually basically impossible to answer, is what's the average age <laughs> of applicants? <laughs> yeah, um, Adam's right. That's I'm just I'm flipping through my slides here to just get a get a good landing uh, place. There, I, I have no idea. To, to be totally honest with you, I'm always the kind of guy who, if I don't know, I'll say I don't know. Seven thousand people average age. Um, I, I'm not even going to guess. It's, um, it's actually dependent on the type of program that someone is applying to. Exactly, uh, and exactly, uh, and, and and all the various Fulbright um, subgrants have wonderful FAQs on their sub websites. So, um, can't, sorry, but can't answer that. Um, and uh, uh, the next one is: What career career stages do applicants tend to hail from? Well. Um, Again, it really depends. There are Fulbright awards for PhD researchers, and, and that's a certain career stage, and obviously the age range of a PhD person is quite broad. Um, there are specific Fulbright programs for journalists. There are specific Fulbright programs for um, teachers. Um, and then a lot of Fulbright recipients are straight out of college. They have no prior work experience at all. So again, it, it really depends, and there's a very broad range. Um, start with yourself figure out where you fit on the Fulbright map and um, and get great information again using the internet to find out what what they want from you um, did, did, that's a vague answer but does that help Adam or do you want to clarify I, I, that? I think I, I think that I think that 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 answers it I mean the the really complicated thing about advising uh, on Fulbright is it's it's so country specific like what might apply for an LLM in Switzerland could be totally different from what applies in in Japan and what applies to an American who wants to study overseas. It's all so variable. Yeah. Um, next question for you. Um, do you recommend applying after securing admission or before securing admission? Um, I think you. I think you have to apply. I think you have to. In the case of the for Americans going abroad, um, you have to start before the initial deadline. I was looking online recently to figure this out. Um, the one I found for, for example, current college students is um, step one is like August, and um, and often the real program deadline might not be until say January or so. And so again, it really depends on your situation, but it's. Almost always in my clients' cases, and again, it's another reason why it's great to even just apply for a Fulbright ASAP, is that um, you you can often secure Fulbright support before getting into school, and it's a great thing to mention at an interview, oh, I, you know, or in an essay. I've already secured Fulbright 
I've got my Fulbright, now I'm trying to get into your school, is a great story. It's sort of a, a huge stamp of approval. Does, does that jive with your experience as well, Adam? Yes, it does. Um, next question. Can one apply to parts of the program in multiple countries? In other words, I think, can you make multiple applications to Fulbright? Uh, the answer, uh, that's a great question, and I saw that, on the, I saw that uh, question on the Fulbright website. Um, the, general, the, the short answer is no, but there are, of course, exceptions. There are, um, there are things that are set up by countries to empower people, to enable people to do just that. But in general, no, it's for a specific country rather than a region. Um, you know, I want to go to Europe and travel around Europe for a year and interview people is usually not smiled upon because it's, it's too general and it's too vague. But again, or is always an exception, um, you may find a specific Fulbright program set up between country A and country B um, where you could uh, go back and forth. But again, it would depend. You'd have to find that for yourself um, by, by digging in deep. Does, it, does, that, does that answer the question? And Adam, do you, does that also... Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a that's a good answer. The next one is a, a very specific one, um, and the question is: I'm a Ukrainian who wants to get a grant for the MBA in the U.S. and uh, for my new uh, magazine in the former Soviet Union. Um, which Fulbright country do I need to choose from? Um, um, well, you want to go to you want to go to the U.S. So you're going to apply through the Fulbright organization in the Ukraine, who um, is picking people for Fulbrights to America. Does that answer the question? I believe it does. Yeah. And in, in, in other words, um, and and a quick word on MBA. Uh, most of what I do in my normal admissions counseling work is is MBA. Uh, it's not all that I do, but it's a lot of what I do. And I've had lots of clients uh, over the years get um, get. The Fulbright in order to do an MBA. It's not just for academic research. Um, it's possible to do. It's not easy, but I see it happen mm. all the time. And, uh, and, 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 and I, know, I know Adam has as well. So there's nothing wrong with trying to get an MBA as long as it, um, again, contributes to the organization of the Fulbright itself and isn't just about you, not only about your personal career advancement, but also about you know, the mission of the Fulbright organization. Um, an MBA is a fine use of a Fulbright award. Um, Vince, what do you think? Because I know you've had a, had a great deal of experience with with helping MBAs get the Fulbright. Um, what do you think is is the real critical issue there? Um, because it's uh, it appears to be quite hard, actually, and, and you've been very successful at it. Well, um, a, a larger mission, a, a, lar a larger mission that 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 meets the Fulbright mission of increasing mutual understanding and and knowledge exchange between countries. There was a, um, uh, yeah, I would say that's a common feature among all the people I've ever worked with who got a Fulbright Award who were pursuing an MBA was that they all had some sense of being a bridge. Um, most of them were from Japan because that's where I'm based. Um, and not only increasing um, you know, business ties, which are already quite strong between the US and Japan, but increasing mutual understanding and, and bringing back valuable knowledge, um, let's say corporate governance, for example, or, um, you know, charitable contributions. How should companies support government in, in donating money and supporting social causes? The U.S. Is, is a leader in that area. Japan wants to learn about it. People have written grants about that subject. I mean, just to give examples, but, um, or very hopefully vague examples, but um, does that answer the question? A, a sense of mission and, and more than just um, you know getting becoming this type of person or that type of person only in terms of my career, but through that, creating a a, communi a bridge of communication and mutual understanding and, and mutual support among countries. So I would say, in, in short, think big. Okay. Um, uh, and then um, maybe this will be the final question. But um, how many months on average do you think it takes to go through the process? Well, um, it. I, uh, month on average, I, it all depends on how much thought you've put in already. I, I would say that, and again, it's it's a non-answer. But um, on average, I would say I've never, from my personal experience, I've never worked with anyone who got a Fulbright award who spent less than a month on the process. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, I mean, in some cases, you know, we could be talking years. If, if again, if it's an academic. 
um, type of award and you're deep into your research, everything you've done in the past is kind of the leading up to the fold, right? But if you just want to talk about filling out the application, getting the transcripts, submitting the recommendation letters, writing the essays, going through the interviews, um, and I would say plan on about six months of your life here, folks, uh, would, would be safe. Um, and then again, on top of that, you want to be applying for other scholarships and you've got to get admitted to school. Fulbright's not a school. It's support to go to school. You've still got to get into the school itself. So it's a long haul here, folks. But again, as, as I think you know, if you're giving up your time to listen to this, the, the, uh, the rewards are, are really are, are, are infinite. So good luck to everybody. And, and I, I, I really encourage all of you to apply. I think the process is really the best possible use of, of your time. All right, Vince. Well, I'm sorry we didn't get to a few of the uh, remaining questions, but um, first of all, I want to thank Vince for doing a great presentation and uh, uh, managing under uh, extreme technical difficulties. Uh, <laughs> and I thank everyone's uh, patience for, for our, our little difficulty there. Um, if all of the attendees could provide feedback, that would be great. Um, for us, we're really interested in knowing your opinion about this because it's really the first time we've done it and we want to make it as good as possible the next time we, we try it out. Um, I want to thank the attendees for attending, asking questions, and uh, providing feedback. Um, you know, I definitely think, you know, Vince has provided you with some great uh, links, uh, so please uh, review anything posted today uh, in a, the, the, as well, but the links in his, in his blog. Um, I mean, in his, in his presentation, and consider signing up for later webinars. Um, there are a few left, um, including one I'm going to be doing on reapplication in, in about an hour. Um, I want to thank everyone again, and um, we're going to end the recording and leave the webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.